again. This is uh, Laurie Stanford of Affirmative's marketing team, and welcome to today's panel discussion on the business value of ERGs. Today's presentation is being recorded and is in listen-only mode and will last approximately 55 to 60 minutes. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you can enter those in the questions section of your control panel, and we will answer as many questions as possible immediately after the presentation. If we are unable to answer your question during the allotted time, we will follow up with you individually via email. Also, as you exit today's webinar, you will see a brief survey. Please take a few moments to complete our survey and let us know um, how we did today. And finally, a copy of the presentation and recording will be sent over to all registrants within a few business days. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Manit Sarai. Manit serves as the Chief Product Officer for Telescope, a key business technology partner for Affirmity. Telescope provides all-in-one SaaS platform for managing DE&I programs, and Manit has extensive experience working with Fortune 500 organizations to digitally transform their ERG and other DE&I programs. Now with logistics taken care of, I will turn over to Manit to begin our discussion. Manit. Oh, looks like you're still on mute, Manit. All right, perfect. All right, thanks a lot, Lori. Appreciate you doing the introduction there. And thanks a lot everyone for joining today. So as Lori said, my name is Manit Sarai and I'll be moderating the panel for today. First thing we wanna do is just go through introductions for our panelists so that you have an understanding of who they are, the companies they represent, some overviews of their BRG or ERG programs, just to help set context and set the stage. So foremost, I'd like to call on Sam uh, Renovato just to give a quick introduction, and then we'll go sort of round robin across the panelists. Ren, uh, Sam, go ahead. Thank you, Manit. Uh, as Manit mentioned, my name is Sam Renovato. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm so excited to be here. I am the Director of Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Ingredion. Uh, for those of you that don't know Ingredion, we are a global ingredient solutions company. Uh, we work with sweeteners, starches, uh, texturizers across the food and beverage industry, um, as well as uh, pharmaceuticals as well. Uh, as far as what our BRGs uh, look like, so first we have BRGs, so business resource groups is what we call them internally which is uh, what some other companies might call ERGs. We have nine of them um, globally, um, and we've launched, um, the first one's launched officially, I think in 2017, so we've been around for about five years, um, our BRGs have. Um, since we've been using um, Affinities by Telescope, uh, we've been able to track our membership. So right now we have around 10% of our global population that's a member, uh, which I think is pretty good since we just launched in March and we we're already seeing some really good um, uptick in our membership as well. Um, and our BRGs really make an impact for, for us internally. We do look at them as kind of like the conscience of our organization and they help us kind of see what's important for our employees and their members. Um, and they also really help support and execute our DNI strategy. Excellent, thanks a lot, Sam. All right, next I'd like to turn it over to Angela. Angela, please give a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Angela Curley, and I'm a Senior Manager for, of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Hankel North America. I've been with them for 24 years, and I have had the honor and the privilege of launching uh, ERGs uh, here at Hankel, and also had the privilege of being a president and also their liaison as well. We have some 18 employee resource groups, that's what we call them here in North America. Uh, again, the genesis of them started like 20, 25 years ago, but we had a refresh in 2017 to really take them and accelerate them to the next level. Uh, and we partnered with Affirmity really to launch the uh, Affirmity platform this year to really help with the launch of those newer, newer ERGs this year. And we also see them as a, the voice of employee, the voice of consumer and customer to really help us to really accelerate our business priorities uh, for the company. And we're really excited to partner with Affirmity with helping us to uh, build that communication within our organization. So thank you for having me. Yep, thanks a lot, Angela. All right, we'll go to Jennifer next. Thank you, Manit. Uh, Jennifer Gamboa Copeland, uh, she, her pronouns, um, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at McKesson. 
and my visual identifiers are a Latina with black hair, maybe growing a little bit, a turquoise top, and a checkered black and white mm -hmm. screen in the background. Um, McKesson uh, is a medical pharmaceutical distributor um, company that mostly is known uh, these days for the distribution of the COVID vaccine. Um, and so ex excited to be here to share a little bit about what our um, employee resource groups um, do. We have 11 of them and the oldest originated about 12 years ago in 2010, which was our military um, ERG. Uh, we have around uh, 14,000 total members, um, which equates to about 7,400 unique members, as you know, everyone can be part of multiples. Um, and so uh, we are uh, global as well, so U.S., Canada, and some in Europe. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Appreciate that. And all right, our final panelist, Wally. Uh, thanks, Monique. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wale Shalade, Vice President DEI at Santine Corporation. Uh, we are a Fortune 50 managed care organization focusing and delivering government-sponsored healthcare programs. We are the largest Medicaid managed care organization in the U.S. and also do have a bit of an international footprint in which we operate. Um, we're probably one of the largest companies we've actually never heard of, but we've been working to change that. We operate health plans in every single state in the United um, States. And so really excited to be here. Uh, we operate employee inclusion groups, is what we call our groups, and actually pretty excited because we launched our first one in November of 2017. And earlier this week, just crossed the 14,000 member mark um, in participation across the five EIGs that we have here at Centene. And so we're looking forward to that ongoing growth um, of participation and engagement with our workforce. And the Affinity Platform, which we brought on board about two and a half, three years ago now, has been a, a vital part of our ability to accelerate um, the growth and maturity of our EIGs, which was a, a huge priority um, for me when I designed and launched them in 2017-2018. So happy to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Wally, and thanks a lot to all the panelists for giving an introduction and giving some of that additional context of your organizations and the various programs that you're running uh, internally. So now what we want to do, now that we have introductions wrapped up, we actually want to go into the main questions of our panel today. So foremost, we're going to start with a high-level question just around overall strategy. Uh, Angela, I'd love to call on you first. If you want to give just some high level anecdotes on how you look at ERG strategy, how do you look at that from a technology uh, point of view, but then also how do you look at that from more of a adoption as well as empowering your ERG leaders to be the best that they can be in those, in those various groups. If you can shed some light on that, what you're doing both in that strategy, technology, as well as overall empowering side, uh, that'd be much appreciated. And that would create a really good uh, construct for us to go into some of the deeper questions uh, for today's panel. Angela, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that. First, I want to just provide a little background about who Henkel is. Um, so we're both a um, consumer goods company with some of the brands you may have heard, Dial, Got to Be, uh, Purex, and then also we're uh, an organization that has an industrial adhesive side. You may have heard of, of a product called Loctite, and we provide adhesives for different industries, including automotive, uh, technology, electronics, um, and also general industries like furniture companies and um, appliances. So I wanted to be able to provide that context. We're 145 years old. We're based in Dusseldorf, Germany, and we have operations in many regions around the world, including North America, and they've done a number of acquisitions here in North America. And Part of the strategy for Hankel was really wanting to do an employee engagement, really getting them engaged in the success of our company, and also uh, providing a platform for employees to be heard. Uh, and ERGs is certainly one of those platforms. Um, and our employees really takes an active role in the ERGs in terms of professional development, community outreach, um, as well as, again, voice of consumer, voice of employee. And, and since 2020, there's been a real acceleration of our DNI programs with the ERGs being the linchpin of our success, the success of the programs. And I'd like to emphasize that the people who run the ERGs are champions who are doing this work on top of their daily work. 
and who want to support the growth of our company's culture to create a sense of belonging by, prov by providing that voice. And the technology is great. Affirmity has been fantastic. Uh, and we really appreciate the support of folks like uh, Manit. Um, and supplement that with training and tools is just a d dynamic next step. And we offered the uh, Affirmity um, ERG Masterclass. We had a summit as a, step, as a step two in the process of supporting our ERGs. And it really provided a framework for the why, the what, and the how of ERGs, taking them to that BRG level. And they walked away with tools to create an 18-month plan of actions and activities to align with the business priorities and impact society fulfilling that right thing to do. And, and also, you know, we're developing leaders, uh, leadership skills and leveraging the master, master class and additional trainings uh, to really help them honestly feel like they're a part of the business by doing that. So, you know, we believe that it's important to support and empower um, our ERGs, you know, not as an opportunity just to have a group, but also the training tools and the platform and the resources really, you know, help them to be successful. Definitely. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Angela. And I know, Angela, you do have a hard stop on today's panel. I had a little bit of a business priority there. So I just wanted to make that acknowledgement so folks know, understand that you might be dropping off soon. But really appreciate that context, Angela. It really helps set the stage for our panel today, again, around overall strategy. How do you sort of tie technology in with some of the more supplementary things you can do to empower your ERG leaders, as well as how, how Henkel really views BRGs from an overall business standpoint. And I think that's a really good dovetail into my next question here which is really how organizations are driving uh, more sort of concrete business value from BRGs, right? So BRGs are great from a community standpoint, uh, bringing together culture and things like that, but they can also be really great enablers for business metrics and business value, whether that's inclusive product development, targeting specific populations, recruitment and such. Uh, I'd like to call on Sam for this next question to really talk about how you're leveraging your BRGs within Ingredion to drive some of those more concrete business values uh, internally. Sam, would you like to um, sort of give some, shed some light on on those uh, specific programs that you're doing within Ingredion? Yeah, absolutely. And just to kind of add on to um, Angela's point earlier about technology helping, I think, because um, in a lot of companies, if not most of them, the, the BRG leaders, this is something that they do in addition to their day job. I think the technology takes away some of that administrative work that they shouldn't have to do to begin with. So I think that's been some of the feedback that we've received. It's a lot easier for people to join and find information as well. Um, so I think that's one of the, the benefits for, for the technology. Um, to answer your, your question, I have two examples that I think for me are very exciting. Uh, for one of them, um, we have uh, one of our nine BRGs is called Empowered, which is Empower Employees with Disabilities. And so um, we just expanded into North America this year. And one of the things that they did that was really cool is kind of showcase and feature uh, one of our solutions. So um, one of the three things that the BRGs are supposed to be able to do throughout the year um, is kind of close the gap on several areas. One of them is the business and product knowledge, uh, because like many global companies, a lot of people don't know everything that we do. So when you're able to kind of showcase some of those and tie it to communities that it impacts or it helps, uh, I think it really brings to life the work that our employees do. Um, so our Empower BRG uh, partner with some of our uh, business leaders and they talked about uh, one of the starches that we use that is used in thick water and for those of you that don't know thick water is literally what it sounds like it's water that is thick uh, so when we add the starch to it it becomes a little bit more texturized um, and it helps people that have dysphagia and so dysphagia is kind of like the medical term that we that they use for people that have difficulty swallowing uh, that can come from uh, different medical conditions or as we age is something that might happen. So I think that's also something that, you know, it's good to learn and to know. Um, I think if you don't know anyone that's been impacted, um, at least when you walk through, uh, you know, Walgreens, there's like that back aisle where you have all of that, uh, those products that you'll notice thick water back there. So I think that's one of the ways in which the, the BR, this specific BRG was able to kind of tie in are the products that we do to communities that are, are impacted and providing some of that visibility and transparency. The other one that um, I'd like to talk about is our Pride uh, BRG and also our WIN. So for LGBTQ+, we have Pride and then for our women's group, uh, we have Women in Ingrian, which is WIN. And both of those BRGs have been really good at um, 
establishing and deepening our relationships with our customers. So because we're not directly consumer facing, we're more B2B uh, business that does help us create um, better and deeper relationships with our customers as well. So there's there's been a couple of cross company uh, BRG events that we've put together um, and also kind of like one off conversations, even in sharing our DNI practices um, as well. So I think those are some good examples in which BRGs really help bring more value to the business and deepening our relationship with our customers. Yeah, that, that, that was really good insight there, Sam. And you know, one sort of follow on question to that is that that particular example on the product development side, how did that sort of flow down the business? So did it come from the actual product engineers that were working on that and they realized that there was a problem and they saw the BRGs as sort of a, a solution or at least a sounding board to help them further develop it? Can you talk about what that actual process looked like? Because I think the audience would, uh, really really appreciate understanding what does that really look like in a day-to-day -day scenario yeah so i think for this particular one um this vision the solution that we've had it's been around for over i think 100 years um so it's not something that was more uh, recently created but one of the things that they come out of it is in looking at product innovation right so um we had uh, people that were working on this um, particular ingredient present kind of like the history of it and looking at the innovation side, we did talk about what could it look like for people to have like a good everyday experience, right? So um, right now um, there's a couple of options for thick water. So you can actually have a product that's already made or you can have the, the starch that you add to like your meal and then you kind of stir it and then you can have um, your dinner. So we talked about like the, the experience, right? Right now we have powder, what would it look like if we were to be able to package it a little bit differently, right? So we had a couple of ideas that were brought up uh, as a result of that session that were submitted to the business. Um, and hopefully we'll hear um, a little bit more about which ones they've kind of selected. But I think that's important to kind of know how do you provide someone that has a condition a solution that is gonna make their life better so that when they go to a restaurant, they don't have to bring out this huge can. Maybe it'll be just like, a small cube or something different um, that they can bring. So I think that's something that's really cool for everyone to also keep in mind and just making sure that everybody has a good experience. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's really good insight there, Sam. Really appreciate you sharing those those multiple examples with the audience here. All right, so now sort of going off of that question again, we're tr trying to really hone in on these uh, particular conversations around ERGs providing business value, and I think that was a really good example, really of how uh, the overall programs can provide sort of business value around products and things like that, but then also internally, how can they provide value around sort of key talent pillars? And Raleigh, I'd love for you to sort of chime in here. And when we're thinking about talent pillars, these can be things like performance, turnover, retention, uh, promotion grades, and things like that. So Wally, I know you have a ton of experience leveraging technology to really get to some of these key ROI metrics so you can exemplify the power that the BRGs have internally, but, you know, sort of dovetailing off SAMs where, you know, that they're really focused from a product standpoint, I think it's also really important to uh, really indicate how they're helping internally improve processes or just improve talent pillars. So while I do want to chime in and give some examples on how you're leveraging technology, whether it's a telescope platform or even other tools like other HRAS or analytic tools internally, how you couple them together, to really get to some of these key ROI metrics for your organization? Yeah, absolutely. So one of our, our core priorities when our DEI office was officially established was to create sort of the most robust system of reporting that we possibly could. And, and to that effect, we got to work with our partners in our HRIT and HR information systems groups to say, we want to be able to look at sort of the full spectrum of humanity within our workforce by every dimension that technology would allow us to capture. Um, and so we, we are a workday company and, and we pulled in um, what they had from a template standpoint, but very quickly realized that we needed to do some design work of our own. So we literally sat down and sketched out on a piece of paper. Here are the things you want to see. Here is the functionality that we want it to happen, have within it. Um, but then we started looking at, well, we also want to be able to look at trend data in unique ways. We want to be able to forecast, right? Everything from, hey, if we keep hiring a specific demographic at this rate, where do we land 5, 10, 15 years from now? If we keep seeing this level of turnover, where do we land? So we pulled in Power BI and Tableau and started just doing some really cool stuff. And, and you know, even though they're not necessarily on this call, I, I still want to shout out 
our partners there because it takes a tremendous amount of sort of um, business intelligence to be applied to what we're trying to accomplish in DEI. And for us, it very much speaks to the fact that DEI is seen as a business priority. So in the same way that we forecast, you know, uh, sales or goals, we do the exact same thing as it ties to DEI. So when we brought the Affinities platform on board, as you can imagine, it became important that we were able to plug the data that was com that comes out of the platform into our system. And so we went ahead and did a workday integration that allows for a daily flow of insights from Affinity into our Workday and Power BI platform, which then allows us to basically create segmentation strategies within our EIG. So um, we can tell you, you know, everything from the race, ethnicity, the gender to, um, you name the demographic, we can do a cut of it based on our EIG membership. And then we leverage that information and aggregate with our EIG that they go through their planning so that they're a lot more strategic in responding to the needs of the members that join our group. So for example, a significant percentage of our employee network members are individual contributors, which means that they have some very unique needs that our groups can intentionally support. And so having access to that data allows them to be a lot more tactical um, in responding, but simultaneously, we also want to see sort of the value that our groups are adding to our organization in terms of reducing turnover, um, supporting advancement, right? And, and so we're able to also connect the dots using that same data to say, hey, if someone has been part of an employee inclusion group for X amount of time, here is the difference in their in turnover rates for that level versus lower. If someone actively participates, meaning that they're attending programs which we're able to track through the Affinities platform, um, this is what we see in terms of the difference in employee engagement scores, right? And so we're able to, to really leverage those insights to show the organization that, hey, we are helping to reduce turnover. We are helping to support talent attraction and development because here's who's showing up, here's what they're doing, here's how they are contributing back um, to the organization. But being able to develop that really robust, real-time um, system of data, leveraging what we see with our, our Affinities platform and plugging that into everything else that we um, have built on the back end through our talent management systems um, has been a real game changer for us as an organization. Yeah, that, that's that's really insightful, Wale. And kind of a, a supplementary question on that is what does this stakeholder engagement really look when you're trying to get to that level of reporting? So obviously you have a DEI office that's responsible for getting the reporting, putting it back in, but then I'm sure it's not just your office that's doing this all alone, right? There might be counterparts from HRIT applications, from your CHRO office, maybe from you know, brand guidelines and things like that on how that's gonna impact what you're doing in recruiting, outward facing comps. So can you give some insight into what is that real like full circle of stakeholder management look there? Because you know, DEI can't just do everything on its own, right? You're, you're, you need other folks from other business units and things like that. So can you shed some light on how that sort of worked and what that process looked like? Yeah, so you raised a powerful point and I will tell you that the way we approach DEI within our organization is by being very explicit that DEI does not own DEI. We are here to consult and partner with the business, um, but everything that we do basically boils down to this. We want a strategy and a structure that is sustainable, which means that it has to be embedded to and aligned with the business operations, which then means for us, you know, for example, our, our dashboards, all that created in partnership with HR information systems, HR IT, our human resource business partners, HR compliance, legal, like we, we are literally doing, we do everything possible in tandem because it has to absolutely be owned by the the business as it were, right? Like DEI is there to ensure, we're pro there to provide subject matter expertise. But the, the way that it becomes a, an organic part of what happens within the organization is that it's all co-created, right? So that ownership stake is there from day one. I remember, you know, I, I was at a, a conference that that's where I came across Affinity. And I went back and the first person I called was our 
um, HR information systems business partner and said, hey, found this thing that I think we want to bring on board. Tell me how hard it would be to implement, you know, I want single sign on, I want data, this, this. And they're like, uh, it would take a little bit of work, but we can do it, right? We just got to plan, plan the work, right? And so I, I think, you know, there, for us, there's an absolute consciousness that, hey, we, we are co-owners, co-creators of everything. And we would absolutely hate it if someone, you know, popped in on us and said, hey, I want you to do X, Y, Z for me tomorrow versus, hey, can we sit down and talk collaboratively about this idea we have because we think it will deliver X amount of value in this space. Everything that we build is not just for our use, right? Most of what we build actually is for the use of others. It doesn't matter if we're talking about tools and resources or dashboards. Yes, we, we leverage it as a uh, DEI office to provide insight, but the actual day-to-day -day utilization, that is HR compliance. That are, that's our human resource business partners. That's our executive leaders within our business units. These are all platforms and resources that are created to support their ability to deliver the highest level talent management and business operations outcomes. Yeah, that, that's interesting when you talk about who's the actual consumers of that of that particular data. So it's not just you looking at a dashboard and feeling great about it. There's actual real consumers in the organization that are using that for, for actual insights. And, and this is a really interesting question. And, and I'd love to open this up just for uh, other panelists, Jennifer or Sam, if you want to chime in on how you look at reporting, who are the consumers in your organization around reporting, how do you liaison with them, what's the cadence of that? I think that, that would also be incredibly helpful for the audience to hear you know, what is Ingredion doing or what is Kesson doing and, and who are the consumers of that reporting. So Jennifer or Sam, if, if you have anything to chime in there, feel free to address. Uh, I, think a custom, I think the audience here would get a real kick out of hearing how that works in your organizations. Yeah, I'll jump in here um, if you don't mind, Sam. So um, yep. I think that reporting uh, is a key component to um, how we um, uh, measure the work that we're doing, right? And so um, when we think about the different pieces of the business that we work with, um, the feed into Workday, as Wally mentioned, is critical when you think about how you uh, use Power BI to, to provide numbers and data when we think about um, retention, right, when we think about promotion, um, as well as, you know, we do um, analysis on new hires, right? How quickly do they engage? Um, how quickly do mm -hmm. they join an ERG, right? Where is our opportunity space there? Because that really does create community, especially in the virtual environment that we're still in for the most part. And so I think that that um, are things that help us drive our business, right, and help create community for our employees. Um, the other piece I will share from an integration perspective is through our um, employee opinion survey. So we connect that as well to that data so we can understand uh, sentiment of employees inside of ERGs uh, compared to uh, the general uh, uh, population of employees, um, areas of opportunities that we can you know, uh, take action that really are helping um, uh, based off of what employees are are telling us, right? And so I think that that is a really important piece as well. So we're connected in every form and fashion from the data piece, right? I think all of us uh, lead with data first because uh, that's what our leaders and executives expect of us. And so I, um, it is very, very important the way that our systems all work together and feed to create that kind of reporting. Yeah, and I can attest personally that the McKesson team is always honing in on the numbers. <laughs> They're always honing in on the on the numbers on a daily basis. Uh, Sam, uh, anything to add on that part, on the reporting piece, analytics, how you're leveraging that? I know you have a ton of experience even outside of Ingredion. So even if you want to go beyond that, some of your previous experiences at Nielsen and things like that, feel free to chime in on those as well. Yeah, um, I was going to mention for reporting specifically too that it's kind of what helps drive accountability as well for our leaders. Um, I. I do think that that is it's very important, especially when companies make public commitments. At Ingredient, we do have uh, public commitments that we've made around gender and race um, and ethnicity as well. Um, I think as far as like the different partners involved in providing visibility to to the numbers, right? I think it depends on 
the organization's maturity within people analytics. As you mentioned, Manit, um, at one of my previous companies, I think they were very mature and they had their own people analytics department. And that really helped accelerate the visibility of all of our managers having access to, to the data, all of the HRVPs, and it was through visualization. So it wasn't reports that they had to like filter through, it was pretty easy to navigate. Um, and I think that really helps kind of level up a company's um, game within DNI because then everybody can see exactly where they're at and they know exactly where they're going. Um, I think if you're earlier on in that journey, you still shouldn't be discouraged. Um, obviously partnering with uh, your HRIS team uh, and your HRBPs um, is very important. I think having those conversations about understanding not only what happened with the numbers, but why it happened. I think having that partnership with HR to understand what happened within this organization. Do we have an acquisition? Are we having a retention issue? Did we put maybe like a new compensation plan in place? I've had organizations before where, you know, a new, you know, sort of incentive was put together. They didn't see the uh, positive impact right away, but it's because it took uh, some time for the first payout to happen. So I think it's a lot of really cool things that you can do with data and the fact that you're able to get that from Affinities and Telescope and get it by employee, it really does help kind of tie in the numbers and have more of those high level insights within people analytics. Yeah, definitely. And, and Sam, you, you, you made me think about sort of an off topic question here, but I'd love to pose it back to Wale and sort of circle it around. So Wale, your organization does a ton of acquisitions and things like that. And all of your companies probably do, McKesson, Ingredient and things like that. And so acquisitions are hard, especially when you're doing post-merger integration. These things can take two years, three years, but the people component of that can probably start a little bit earlier. So Wally, if you want to chime in on, uh, I know Centene, you're constantly probably in acquisition mode. How do you see sort of your BRGs being that sort of driver for saying, hey, we know the full PMI is going to take two to three years, but maybe we can start integrating some, some folks together, start to get at least the cultural mesh going. So that way, you know, the rest of the PMI can be a little bit smoother. Well, Wale, could you chime in on that? I think the audience would love to hear about your experiences and how you handle that internally at Centene. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I would say that it gives us an opportunity to actually hit the ground running from a culture standpoint, right? Because we've got the champions that are able to say, this is who we are. These are the things that we to engage with one another. And it's not necessarily seen as a um, corporate thing, right? Because our groups are employee-driven, employee-led. So you are getting to interact with your colleagues, um, your new colleagues, right? We're, we're getting to build new relationships. And that's something that we tried and, and um, driven home sort of the point. This is about deepening interpersonal relationships. This is about how we work together better. Um, and so, you know, we, we had a, a recent acquisition where one of the first things we did was, hey, there's no DEI framework with this organization that is joining us. And we know it will take a while before, you know, if we get to full systems integration. But guess what? There is a strong appetite for what our team does. There's a strong appetite for employee networks. So how do we get that ball rolling so that our new colleagues can get insight into what already exists, right? And they don't have to feel like they're, they're starting from scratch or any of that. And so, you know, it, it was uh, you know, probably the second, third, fourth one since, since I've been with the organization, but it's just always cool to kind of see it start to, to kick in, right? And to start seeing that passion um, build with folks as they start to be able to tap into the personal and professional development um, tools that our groups have, the mentoring programs that our, tools, that our groups run, right? And just the, the even the networking stuff alone, um, you know, I think it's just, it's a really, really powerful way for organizations to show who they are as they flow through acquisitions and to build consistency across that employee experience. Definitely, really appreciate that, Wale. All right, so now just kind of getting back on the overall agenda in terms of questions. I know one of the questions that probably a lot of the audience wants to talk about is really how do you start extending BRGs outside of sort of the core corporate population, right? Traditionally, a lot of these groups were started internally uh, with you know corporate, corporate exempt employees and things like that. Basically, folks who have email addresses, folks that are digitally connected, have digital identities. But many of the companies, and I know all the panelists today, have uh, sort of uh, frontline workforces, non-exempt populations, whether that's yeah, you know, Wale with you at Santine, with your adjusters, your your sort of um, 
your support your support individuals, McKesson, uh, Jennifer with you with a lot of your uh, distribution, fulfillment centers, drivers, and you, Sam, in terms of manufacturing and things like that. This has been a really hot topic agenda item over the past couple of years where it's like, hey, these groups should be more inclusive of uh, the entire employee population. However, there are definitely, there's technological challenges as well as overall legal implications and things like that that you have to address. You know, on, on the basis of it, a lot of those employees aren't digitally connected, right? They don't have laptops, they don't have corporate digital identities, they don't have access into single sign-on and things like that. And then also there's a different uh, legal apparatus for how they're actually employees, non-exempt populations and things like that. So Jennifer, I know you have a ton of experience doing this on the McKesson side, rolling out ERGs to a much broader population. So I'd love to sort of tee you up for this question if you want to give your experience with, you know, what did that really look like, right? How did, you know, there's definitely a technology component of it. Love for you to chime in on that. But then also, what did you really have to do? How did you get the sign off to do that, right? What were the legal parameters that you had to be within to be able to extend out these programs to these different populations? So Jennifer, if you can uh, chime in on that, I know the audience probably represents similar companies that have those types of footprints and they really get a kick out of hearing sort of your experience rolling these programs out to those populations. Sure thing, Manit. And as you mentioned, kind of the, the population that we were, uh, that we came to to realize that we needed to address more, right, was our distribution centers, our um, drivers, um, our call centers. And so how do we engage when they don't have either access to or time to, um, you know, participate and engage in the ERG communities? Um, I will share the first thing that we we felt was really important was that connection piece. And so through our ERG mobile app, um, through the, uh, uh, it connects directly to the Affirmity platform that what we were able to kind of gain that access, right? Um, from a technical perspective, we do, do still have a single sign on in front of it, right? So it is um, a protected space, but um, employees can download on their personal devices, right? And so they can have access to the same information or similar information to what sits on the Affirmity platform. Um, it allows them the opportunity to join, um, to see announcements, events, um, attend events, R RSVP for events, and most importantly, the calendar, right? Um, so um, as, as you all probably know, calendaring um, numerous ERGs is always an issue. And so the, the ability for um, our frontline employee to have access to see when events are happening has been um, very important. Um, the second piece I will say is um, the mentoring platform and right the ability to connect um, our um, corporate employees, right, those and wired employees who have access to um, computers on a regular basis. We're um, going through the pilot process of connecting with those who are not wired, right, so distribution centers, um, call centers, and how we can create some more of that connectivity between the two because um, as we found out, obviously, through our um, EOS scores, our employee opinion surveys, that you know, there is opportunity here, right? And there is a desire from both perspectives um, to learn more about what the others are doing. Um, so the mentoring platform um, also in, in this application has really helped us. Um, the third component was internal um, and how we have made this in, uh, successful in regards to our uh, partnership with our corporate communications team. And so, um, you know, we did uh, table tents at all distribution centers and uh, multiple languages, set up uh, a microsite on our internal website for distribution center leaders and frontline leaders to be able to access the information to download themselves and print and, and really um, share out. Um, also, uh, the creation of videos, um, one pagers. QR codes, like all of those things that make it really simple and easy. Um, our corporate communications team has really um, jumped in to help us facilitate um, and share in a uh, unified manner, which is always important <laughs> um, to all of our employees. Um, and specifically, you know, things like highlighting um, heritage months, right? That's a great opportunity for our front lines to get engaged and in enjoy the community opportunities that are now becoming available um, since we are getting out a little more. Um, I know you did have one question about the, the legal perspective, the technical perspective of kind of how we were able to do some of this. And um, that obviously is through the protection of our single sign-on, right? Um, that has helped mm -hmm. us be able to get a lot of this um, work done. Um, but that continues to be a challenge we work on um, in regards to like 
people remembering what their passwords are and, <laughs> and things like that, that actually yeah. have to be reset by the distribution center manager, right? And so how do we yeah. continue to educate, right? That's that's on us as a as a ERG operations team to help um, facilitate that. Definitely, yeah, I really appreciate that insight there, Jennifer. And I think that really helps our audience understand where it's like, hey, everyone wants to sort of roll these things out, but you can't, like, as well, I was saying, you can't just kind of do it yourself, right? There needs to be marketing teams involved, comms teams involved. There needs to be um, just basic assets and materials that can be distributed to individuals so that they understand how they can participate in the groups, how they can actually access it and things like that. Because just rolling out a platform on its own is not gonna do much good, right? Well, one, well, one email to, out, out to a distribution center leader is not gonna make it to where it needs to be. But if you really have that tight coordination between your teams, as well as your other stakeholders, your marketing brand, comms, legal folks, it really does sort of take that village to be able to start extending these programs out. And I know our other panelists here, Wally, as well as Sam, you have similar sort of uh, uh, makeup in terms of your organization with the corporate employees, as well as for your frontline populations. So if, if you either of you want to chime as well on how you're looking at that from your organization, what are the real drivers behind that? When did you sort of start on that particular side of the journey? I think the audience would love to hear that as well. So Wally or Sam, uh, either if, if either one of you wants to go first, feel free to go ahead. Yeah, and I think um, outside of the, the technology, although this is in the technology as well, um, we have what we call our inclusion leads for some of our sites. Mm -hmm. So this is an, a journey that we just started this year. So it's still in progress, uh, but we, we are looking for our, our plans to have inclusion leads for each of our BRGs. Um, and even for those where we don't have an inclusion lead, like um, Jennifer was mentioning for like the affinity months, we do make sure to ship some swag for those to at least start the conversation, right? Because we're looking to have a lot of times um, these uh, employees don't have visibility to to BRG. So by bringing some swag, they start to ask questions like, oh, what is this about? And how can we get more information? And how can we get one started here? So I think trying to be a little bit proactive and just bringing more visibility to what we have um, and then having the inclusion leads. Um, and they are also ones that we look to for feedback uh, because I know from, from our side, for example, you know, it makes total sense to have like a lunch and learn. But for some people that are, uh, you know, in our plants or, or manufacturing facilities, you know, it doesn't make sense because they, it might be a better time like at 2 p.m. when they're doing like a shift change. So there's a lot of those things to consider that you can learn when you talk to the people and get their feedback on what would work best for their site as well. So still on that journey, many, but I'm excited. I took yeah. um, some mental notes from what Jennifer shared as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Wally, anything to add on that, on how you look at for your frontline populations? I know you have adjusters, call center folks, and things like that that need to manage plans. Wally, anything to add there from your end? Yeah, it would actually be building on what Sam mentioned around sort of the workforce management component of it, right? Because, for example, at our claim centers, a lot of that work is very time specific. So we actually bring in and, and have engaged our workforce management people, the folks that actually take their scheduling and say, hey, Here's what's coming. Here's where we might be looking for us to create space for people to participate in things. We recognize that not everyone's going to be able to, um, you know, take an hour away from the phone or the computer or what have you. But is there a way that we can schedule, right, and create a, either a first come, first serve or some sort of approach that allows people to sign up and they are scheduled accordingly? So we've been um, exploring that. We've been having conversations with people leaders right around their role as well. And again, facilitating the opportunity, the ability for employees to engage in what's happening so that we are able to minimize where possible um, the idea of I, I don't have time, or I'm not able to, or I don't have the resources. So kind of taking everything that Sam and, and Jennifer mentioned, right? The, the micro learning, the, the more, sort of intentional communications pieces, and then actually creating the space for people to consume um, what's also being built and making sure that their people leaders understand that this is as much a priority for the organization as them doing X, right, within, within our, our company. Yeah, and, and I think one of the powerful, powerful things about extending ERGs and BRGs out to those populations is it does give those individual employees just a deeper purpose of connection to the overall organization. You know, when I was younger, I used to work in retail for a bunch of different large retailers and things like that. And when you're in those, when you're in those sort of roles, you're very just focused on the day-to-day -day tasks, right? Whatever your sort of core role is, you're just trying to do that. And you don't really have this tie back to the overall brand, the overall corporation and things like that. 
but BRG is a really good way to be able to send that, allow them to bring their whole selves to work, and then also build more meaningful connections, right? Meaningful connections with colleagues from different office locations, different business units, on the corporate side of things, and that can allow them just to have that deeper sense of purpose with the overall organization. So we're doing incredibly good on time here. I do want to tee up one last question for the panelists, which is just about like how you're looking at long-term stat strategy. So in terms of sustainability of your programs, um, the long-term adoption of the programs, do you plan on growing overall ERGs or sort of just growing the ones you have? How are you looking at more sponsorship of the overall program? I would love for uh, the panelists just to shed some light on, you know, what does the next 12 months all the way out to 36 months really look like? So both near-term as well as long-term strategies of how you're seeing your programs evolve, how you're looking to keep them sustainable in the organization and things like that. So, you know, Sam, I'd love to go to you first, and then we can just sort of go down Jennifer and Wale accordingly. So, Sam, if you want to give some insights to the audience just about long-term strategy of your program, uh, that'd be much appreciated. Yeah, so one of the things that you mentioned um, in your question was sponsorship. So just want to call out that, you know, for our overall structure, and I think for a lot of um, companies in their structure, having sponsorship is very important for us. We have members um, that are direct reports to our CEO, we call them our ELT. So each one of them is a sponsor to one of our BRGs. Um, that's kind of part of what is expected from our leadership. Um, it's also part of what keeps them connected to all to our employees, you know, making sure that they know what like the day-to-day -day employee experiences and what some of their concerns are. Um, we also have within, uh, we call them impact teams. They also help sponsor some of the uh, local activities and when I mean sponsor I mean like money right because ultimately uh, a lot of these BRGs do need some sort of budget to help um, put together some of these events and engagements uh, but they also help champion initiatives and remove barriers from them um, so I think as far as what what I'm thinking for long term next year or so for our BRGs there's a couple of things so definitely looking to expand the current BRGs that we have I think um, activated on the intersectionalities that our BRGs have with each other is something that the BRGs have been a really great job since I've been here doing. Um, in other companies, that's something that needs a little bit of coaching, but I think they've been doing really good here. Um, I think also looking at the BRG leaders themselves, uh, positioning our BRG leaders as a like a leadership development program, right? So for the business to see that these are people that are willing to go the extra mile to create a more inclusive culture and are also really great leaders. They, they're building on all of these other skill sets that are required to run a successful team. Uh, so kind of going through that journey right now on how do we, what are some of the different coaching opportunities we can give them, um, sort of training, networking, uh, leadership disability. So we did have our second BRG forum a couple of weeks ago where we brought in similar to how you would have it with like your team, right? When you're trying to plan your strategy for next year, uh, you don't wanna be distracted. So this is kind of like the purpose of our BRG forum. We bring all of our BRG leaders together and we give them, um, we have like two days where it's uninterrupted time. You're here to learn, uh, to develop you as a leader and to plan your 2023 strategy. So I think that's something that uh, we're gonna continue to do. And hopefully once we have more of that historical information in telescope, um, I know at other organizations, I've compared kind of like the promotion rates for our BRG leaders compared to the everyday population. And we did see a difference at my other organization. Um, and the same thing with engagement. I know, Jennifer, you were talking about your engagement survey and kind of looking at the difference in those as well. So it's kind of where we're, we're going. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Sam. Really appreciate that. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to chime in on just sort of your long-term strategy where you're looking for McKesson to go with your BRG program, again, either near-term or long-term out? Yeah, I think we have a few kind of near term and long term um, activation that we're we're working through. Um, so, you know, obviously engaging more members, um, not only um, getting more members, but engaging them. And how do we in the measurement of that? Um, so through RSVPs and attendance and things like that. Um, also, you know, as we pivot to more members and we are trying to come back to the office a little more frequently, right, how do we make that work, right? Um, and so I think that's something that all ERGs are trying to work through um, and we'll continue to see that happen, um, especially as the current workforce stays as is, right? So most people are wanting to stay and work from home if their jobs permit that. And so how do we keep people engaged um, in this virtual space where everyone's a square box? Um, and so how do we continue to do that, I think is really important. As well as what Sam mentioned about, you know, 
um, amplifying um, the career and leadership skills that are developed inside of an ERG and how mm -hmm. you can um, capitalize on that as a business unit leader um, and how that can help not only in the succession planning of a, a business unit, right, but also in the succession planning of an ERG, right, which is really important. And one of the areas we'll continue to focus on is the succession planning for our employee resource groups as you know, they evolve, right? Um, because what we are finding is that most people have been in their positions for a long time. And that piece um, is, is causing burnout and less engagement and that kind of um, filters down. And so how do we help with some of that as well um, mm -hmm. from a DEI organization? Um, and then when we think about, you know, driving business value, right? That's an area that we are um, continuously uh, focused on as well as what can we as ERG leaders or um, ERG operations team bring to our supplier diversity chain, right? So how do we get involved in different places that really um, can be impactful for the business? And so that's another area that we are um, looking to, um, you know, amplify over the next couple of years. Definitely. All right, Wally, over to you. So long-term strategy, either 12 months out, 36 months out, what do you, what are you all at Centene really looking at? And what was sort of on your roadmap there? Yeah, so I, I think for us, it's this evolution to a fit for purpose approach that captures some of what Sam and Jennifer talked about, right? So we're looking at this idea of increasingly distributed work environments. We're looking at sort of shrinking relational ecosystems, right? We're looking at this idea of greater responsibility for the employee experience within the organization and so how can we leverage our groups to support that um, as we kind of transition and move through this new environment so we've gone from an organization where you know the it was sort of you work from work and the pandemic hit and you know we, we flipped to hybrid and and we had the conversation about well, we'll bring everybody back, but the reality was that not that was not something that um, would continue to keep our workforce engaged. So we are now a majority hybrid remote environment, which means that you know our our ERG members are working in these distributed work models. You know we're, we're asking them to do more, but they've also gone through kind of this sort of exhausting period of change. So what we are now looking at on how do they deliver value, right? How do they continue to meet the needs of their members? And we recognize, of course, that it can be either or, right? It can't just be, oh, we're doing Zoom or we're doing in-person. So what do asynchronous options look like um, to capture a broader, broader population? And then, you know, where else can we leverage technology right in in driving sort of impact so as we think about the mentoring programs that our groups run we to a certain extent still kept kind of that whole matching process manual not losing the human touch but i also know that there are absolutely ways to streamline the way that works and so we're looking at you know what technology um can do for us, but then really doubling down on this idea of focusing our programming, right? So how can we listen better? How can we analyze better? And then how can we really commit better um, to giving what our members are looking for in terms of why they've joined the groups? And so we're, we're going to be going through a, a process where we want to better equip our ERG leaders, again, similar to, I think, the broader conversation here, where we create a, a system of priorities. So we determine what are consistent priorities, we determine what are unpredictable priorities, and then which things are cyclical priorities, right? Like, what are the things, History Heritage Month programming, that's like a cyclical priority. You're always, always going to do that on a set cadence. Um, so how do we plan in advance and kind of align it with business priorities? Because our organization, you know, again, unfortunately in the society in which we exist, we provide services to 
the underserved and unserved in our society, which unfortunately tend to be women, people of color, children, right? Uh, people with disabilities. So we have very clear opportunities to align what our groups do with the with our business priorities as an organization. And so it, for us, it's really about how do we ultimately leverage our groups in making better decisions. Um, we're, we're not necessarily planning on creating a bunch of new groups. We're always taking feedback and and giving some thought to what might we actually need um, in, in you know the environment that we are in now. But it, it's truly a sort of it has to be an overwhelming need slash desire from the workforce based on the input that they provided us. We we want to take the groups that we have what we're doing and and just crush it, do it even better, continue to deliver value in a way that's so undeniable um, from our employee standpoint that, um, you know, we can be even more intentional and authentic about what we are putting forward. And so getting, for example, to the point where we recognize the folks who are doing, not just recognize them, but reward them, right? And, and that's that's one of the things that I would say is on our roadmap for the future. We want to, we, you know, we know that this will always be something that people do in addition to their day job, but that doesn't mean that we cannot compensate them for doing that. So that's something that, you know, we, we, we've been really digging into and trying to figure out how can we make that work. So, you know, it's, it's really for us, I, I think that the thread through all of this is just going to be tightening the alignment of not just um, our employee networks, but DEI as a whole to the business and to the priorities, right? Creating that sort of inseparable bond where um, if for some reason uh, the DEI lens is not apply to a business or talent management process, anyone within the organization will raise their hand and go, hey, we are missing something here. Yeah, definitely. Appreciate that, Wale. All right, so I think we had a great conversation here, covered all sort of the main topics that we wanted to. Lori, love to turn it back to you just for uh, any closing remarks, polling questions, or any questions from the audience. Okay, great, thank you. It has been a really um, packed hour of great information, and um, we have one last polling question. We just wanna pop up on the screen to kind of get some feedback if you're interested in learning more about our ERG software platform, or if you're interested in learning more about our training. I know we are like at the very top of our hour, but one of the questions I've seen kind of keep popping up from some of our attendees is around budget. Um, if we could just quickly maybe go into, um, you know, how do you um, determine, you know, an ERG budget and like what mechanisms do you use for formulating the budget? Um, do you provide a blanket budget per ERG or are you dedicating dollars per employee? and or dollars per group kind of how does that work do you think maybe we could cover that in the last couple of minutes we have here yeah definitely any of our panelists want to address that particular question yeah i can share some quick thoughts so for us we do fund our eigs directly out of our enterprise dei budget we fund our groups at the enterprise level and their budget is allocated based on the size of um, then our local chapters, the business unit in which they sit. So our, our local health plans are actually responsible for funding their local chapters as well. And we set what those minimum thresholds are based on size. So we've got sort of a grid that says, got this many members, here's what the minimum expectation is. And um, the leadership at that business unit has to agree to that before we actually place the chapter there. Gotcha. Yeah, that's great insight there, Wale. All right, Lori, I know we're at the top of the hour here. Um, so just want to thank all of our panelists for joining. And uh, Lori, if there's any closing remarks from your end, feel free to go ahead. Okay, great. So thank you to all of our panel members and thank you for, Manit, for moderating today's discussion. So just a quick reminder that we did record today's session. So we'll be sending that out to all of our attendees within a couple of business days. Um, also, the session today was HRCI Insurance Credit Approved, so that information will be included in your follow-up email that you will receive. 
And if you think of any other questions, um, you can always send those into info at affirmity.com. And we'll be happy to follow up with you. I know there were some questions that came in that we didn't have a chance to address. So we'll be collecting those questions and kind of um, addressing those individually with some of those people. So again, thanks everybody for your time. And we look forward to seeing you on a future Affirmity webinar. And thank you to all of our panelists and our moderators. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Thank have you a good all. one.